I'm Edna Sessian, the director of the center. Today's program, Mind Matters, Mind Matters, Past, Present, and Future, and the participants are, uh, please raise your hand when I call your name, John Krakauer, who is professor of neurology at neuroscience and John, at Johns Hopkins University, Jonathan Kramnik, who is Maynard Mack Professor of English at Yale University. George Macari is Director the Witt Wallace Institute for the History of Psychiatry at, and Professor at Wild Cornell. Ken Miller, Professor of Neuroscience at Columbia University. And Barbara Montero, Professor of Philosophy, City University of New York. Uh, they are aware that they just start spontaneously the conversation and we'll see where they end up. Thank you. Sorry, maybe we could just begin by saying something about the perspective that we bring to the question. One of the uh, interesting and attractive mm. features of this afternoon, for me at least, is that I am sitting with people who are bringing um, expertise from uh, a variety of different disciplines, um, and none of them my own. So um, I'd be curious to know just simply how you all approach this issue, which is for me a, a literary and cultural question, um, though I'm always excited to think about questions of mind, consciousness, and mental life from an interdisciplinary perspective and bringing into account um, uh, developments in neuroscience, and cognitive science, and philosophy. So now I will pass the torch off to yeah. someone else. So, <laughs> so, so in understanding the mind, are you looking at in literature, yeah. are you looking? Um, does the this a literary story reveal the nature of the mind, or is the does the author of the literary story have insight, or yeah. whose insight are you, you know, uh, benefiting from um, in that well, I, I project? Well, probably the authors, um, but mm -hmm. I, I I tend to focus on questions of the representation of mental life and works of literature. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and how it's changed, I guess. how it's changed or how it took shape in a particular moment in time. Um, and one of the exciting things about working in my particular historical field, which is uh, the 18th century, is that um, uh, at that moment in time, literary writers were in pretty close dialogue with scientists and philosophers um, as part of the emergence of empiricism and all kinds of work into the nature of cognition, the nature mm -hmm. of mental representation, perception, and other kinds of questions in and around mental life that have, you know, posed problems that people are still interested in addressing. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting. Um, and so to me, that side of it is simple. Uh, I think how consciousness arises from me is not simple. In effect, I don't even see how you can approach that as a question. But, um, but mm -hmm. it seems obvious to me that this piece of meat that evolved is what has is the the basis of our our mind. So. Um, I guess I approached it um, from two vantage points, which is that I'm a working psychiatrist, uh, and and that does no doubt inform some of my perspective. But my work has been in the history of ideas, so I would really take off in a way from your point of view and say one of the things that intrigued me and. Um, uh, made me write my last book was the, the notion that we've been living with this problem for many, many years with centuries, and that to think of it as an insoluble problem was fine, but not as interesting as a problem that, in a way, had its own history, had a political history, had a scientific history, had a philosophic history, and that it impacted us as we couldn't solve it and move forward to different iterations of ways of thinking about it. So I really look at it in a way much like you do. Uh, I was interested in, in what happens once we take the, let's say, I don't think it's quite innocent to say it's a, it, it comes from the meat, but then all the difficult problems, as you say, come after the meat. Right. <laughs> I guess it comes with the dessert. We don't know what makes the dessert. <laughs> so I was interested in that story and, uh, and looked at it right through the lens of history of ideas. John, please. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, I always try and think to myself how I would feel being in the audience, and I think <laughs> topics like this are so amorphous and abstract that... Um, so how does one get some concreteness on it? Um, I would imagine in the audience people think mind means thought, 
free will, consciousness, uh, the construction of, of culture. That's fine. That's what people, I think, mean by mind. I mean, it's a sort of slightly human, self-absorbed idea that that's what's making us create all the specialties that we represent. And then there's what you know, Ken just said, which is he, he's a neuroscientist. And we don't, in neuroscience, we don't talk about the mind, we talk about the brain. So the mind is what psychologists and cognitive sort of neuroscientists talk about, and it's what we all consider, that, as I said, the creator of all the things we care about. And then the neuroscientists talk about brain, and then we get this tedious thing, how are we going to bridge the brain and the mind? And, and the answer to that is, we're not. Hmm. Uh, and what do I mean by that? It, it means that, um, and I'll give you a little, a tiny little anecdote. Ken probably knows this. Genelia, does anyone know what Genelia Research Campus is? It's a, it's a big campus for neuroscience. And they've just decided that they're going to switch directions and do something they call mechanistic cognitive neuroscience. Right? Mechanistic cognitive neuroscience, meaning that they're going to spend 15 years to do the bridge between the brain of a fruit fly and cognition. Okay. So they're going to try and operationally define what could possibly be the bridge between mind and brain. And the way they're going to do it is they're going to have to come up with some operational definition of cognition. So I think we can have a fruitful discussion here if we agree that we're going to talk about cognition. Right? Is that thought, free will, consciousness, but that's it. Cognition. Now, depending on how you operationalize mind cognition, you can decide that we are going to have a scientific theory of the mind that is neuroscientific, not psychological. And just the last point I want to make is that it's extremely important to, that the, all the interesting work on the mind to date, in my view, has been psychological, not neuroscientific. Mm. Okay, and in philosophy, we talk about functionalist explanations versus reductionist mechanistic explanations. If you say to somebody, why is that woman crying there in the corner? And you say it's because she's sad, because she lost a loved one. That is a perfectly adequate explanation. To say it's because circuits in her head are misfiring or dopamine levels are low is not an adequate explanation. Okay. Now, anyone who says, oh, and you know, and there are molecules of the moment, oxytocin is very big at the moment, dopamine was really big, and these molecules get this totemic meaning that we think are bridging, and they're not. Okay, so as soon as we move away from causal bridges between the brain and the mind and decide the kind of work we want to do, I think you have to be perfectly happy with saying the woman is sad and never talk about dopamine. Okay, and any attempt to think that you'll explain away the notion of sadness by some reduced circuit or molecular based explanation is a philosophical aporia. It's a non-place. And that, I think, is where we're going to have. And I think many people in the audience really hope that the neuroscientist will solve the mind. It's a non-starter. Okay. Um... Well, it's interesting for me to hear different perspectives on this. I, my work is very interdisciplinary, so I take into consideration literature. That's why I was interested in how you, you know, think about it, because I've looked at Shakespeare and said, well, you know, how did he understand the mind, which is different how the characters sometimes seem to see the springs of action. So, and I look at neuroscience and psychology and um, co common sense. I've even conducted an experiment. And, um, and then re re my own case, too, introspection. I use that, too. And I mix it all together and see what comes out. Um, so, well, so one thing Ken said was certainly the brain is the basis of the mind. And, when, you know, one sense we want to say, yeah, but what I'm, one question I'm interested in, what it means to be the basis of something else. So, because it seems to me, um, from different perspectives, you can see different... You could say, um, 
in a different context, someone might say our um, socialization is the basis of the mind because that's what makes us who we are. Or you could, in a different context, our DNA. Or so, um, yeah. So there's a, so one thing. So my work tends to like focus on um, some very. Well, I have a variety of areas of research, but in my most um, like strictly focusing on the mind and the mind-body problem, focuses on the meaning of that, what can we mean when we th we're looking for the basis, and also um, the question of, um, well, what is that base? <laughs> so we all, want to be somehow materialists or physicalists, but what does that mean? And somehow is there, like, I mean, is we think about the problem of reducing the mind to the brain, but, you know, we haven't reduced chemistry either to physics. So what, is there something special about the mind and its relation to the lower level features that it somehow emerges out of or is based on or is maybe reducible? So, as opposed to other the, uh, stratifications of nature? Or is it just, do we have the same problems throughout? Are they just different perspectives we take on reality? So those are some, some of my thoughts. It's just that you're not, the question why is this woman crying is not asked. So this is a question of like, uh, this is about what, what people are interested in when yeah. they pose a question and what kind of answer they want. I would right? say again, in, the co in some context, it might yeah. be relevant. Right. And I would say in the neurologist's office, maybe if someone's crying all the time, nonstop, maybe you need to figure that out. So it might be no, depending what, on your content. What, what I'm just trying to say is that these conversations <laughs> never end, but they should. In other words, it's, right. it's, it's, it's annoying. It's annoying. What I'm saying is, is right. that... Yeah. You know, it's philosophy, explanation, and understanding and causality have different meanings. Yeah. Physicists have understood notions of emergence and aggregate behavior and complexity for ages. Neuroscientists in particular, and I say this, uh, have a kind of philosophical, sophomoric way of speaking, right? Where, they, because they're sophisticated with their tools and their techniques, they think by inheritance they're also intelligent about talking about these things, and they're not. <laughs> okay. Right. And and, and what, I, what I'm and what I'm what I'm saying is is that it's not. Lots of people have dealt with these problems of levels of analysis. You know, as you said, physics, chemistry, biology. You know, phase transitions in science, complexity. I mean. You know, it, I think it gets down to you. The, the, you know, the book I, that we're writing, I think the title I'm using right now is What Does Neuroscience Want to Know? And I think members of the audience are asking why is that woman sad, mm -hmm. but want the answer to sound like something like dopamine. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is it, as, lo as long as you're in that trap where you're asking a, a question that's never going to yield the kind of answer you feel like. It's like the number 42. I mentioned that in Hitchhiker's Guide to the right. Galaxy. What's the meaning of the universe? 42. No, that's not very satisfying. I wanted something that felt like my question. Right. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that we have a feeling when we ask our question, and we demand that the answer have the same feel as the question. Mm -hmm. And it will not. Yeah. Right? And as long as we accept that, we're fine. You can do causal neurology, yes. You can treat Parkinson's and depression and stroke. That's causal work. That's where the levels matter. But if you're asking understanding explanation, why is this person a good cook? It's because they salt well. It's because they read recipes well. It's because they have a, a knack. And notice what those explanations for why a cook is good are all on Daniel Dennett's intentional level of cooking. If you said they're a good cook because they've got really good spatial working memory, Right? or they have good selective spatial attention, you're no longer explaining why they're a good cook. All you're doing is talking about the perhaps necessary but not sufficient cognitive capacities that you require to be a good composer as well. So it, to me, it's all a bit of a non-question that we like because we all would like the feeling of an answer that we're never going to get. I, I completely uh, agree with you, but I, I'm much more curious rather than bored by the question because, in fact, the non-question becomes a culture. Uh, as you know, the NIMH now demands 
that studies about sadness have biomarkers. You cannot get a grant at the National it's Institute of Mental Health. It's a fetish. Yeah. And so these problems, we have this capacity to sometimes manage better. In the 19th century, Hewlings Jackson said exactly what you said. We're going to basically defer psychic causality, and we're going to look for neural causality. And Wundt started to do the same with, thing with psychology. Everyone was <laughs> mixing mind and brain in a mash of, of nonsense. He said, we're just going to look for psychological causality. The problem is some fields and some people, like psychiatrists and their patients, walk into a situation where they're demanded, it seems like there is a great deal of pressure to think on both sides and to prematurely integrate. Those integrations have been usually disastrous. And presently, I think we're in the midst of another chapter in that with the recent NIMH demand that everyone's going to have to make up a biomarker for every study they do. You will not be able to do a clinical study on sadness. Yeah, so I mean, that, that sounds right to me. And also, I think uh, there's something that's been historically perplexing about the relationship between physical matter and cognition or the mind and the brain over long spans of time. So there's something, at least in the curiosity or the fad or the fetish that you were describing, John, that has cultural significance, if not also political significance. And there's a reason, I think, why we find the, why we're, you know, we started off in this vein, even though with the possible exception of Ken, like it seems like no one here really is committed to a kind of program of reduction. And yet, you know, it's what bugs you, even though none of us really actually are committed to, to explaining in the way that you're afraid of. Well, I mean, but, uh, as I said, that's not true of NIMH, NIMH, well, no, exactly. Geneva. The neuroscientists well, yes, right. genuinely believe yeah that if you can understand heading direction through a ring attractor right. in a fly's brain, that you will then be able to extrapolate from that to other forms of cognition. Mm -hmm. They really do believe that, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and it's... Now look, if they could explain in an argument, you know, Ken just said, I believe one day we will. That's yeah. the religion as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> right? But, yeah. if, uh, but if you're going to come up with a framework as to how that extrapolate. I mean, if you were to say, look, here's an ant, yeah. one little ant, and I'm going to be so intelligent that I will actually infer ant colonies and termite mounds from that one ant. Mm -hmm. Good luck. You never would. Yeah. Right? No, I, I'm, right? I'm inclined to agree with everything you're saying. And, um. uh, and I, unfortunately, neuroscientists say we study the ant because we've got great tools. We can go deep into the ant's brain. We will infer termite mounds. Mm -hmm. which is what cognition would be in an, in a, in an ant colony, as far right, as I'm right, concerned. Right. It's an emergent behavior when you have thousands of ants. Right. But somehow, we're going to work out that, how that thousands of ants work. And there are coarse-grained descriptions of complex systems like ant colonies mm -hmm. that are very explanatory. But they're not single ants, mm -hmm. right? And you substitute ants for neurons, and you can see the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And yet, uh, neuroscientists... <coughs> hate this kind of argument because they're deeply in love with the reductionist work. They, and it's good work, by the way. I think at the level of the work, ants are interesting. Mm -hmm. Neurons are interesting. Mm -hmm. right. Parts of neurons are interesting. Mm -hmm. right? But the idea that if you study and study and study and by some magical non-linear extrap extrapolatory moment, right. you'll have this new thing. It's never happened. I've never seen it. Yeah. That's the problem. I don't agree that it's uh, an insoluble, in principle, uh, separation between the physical and the mental, um, that, that we'll never get there. Um, and just as one you know, simple example you know, that, that John would know very well, but um, you know, we, have, we have the experience that uh, to see this cup and to reach for this cup and to know it's a cup and to be able to reach for it is the same thing. Well, from study of the brain, we now know it's not the same. That there's one system that I use to say that's a cup and it's, it's, a round, it's sort of round and a cylinder and to describe its shape. And there's a completely different system that I use to form my hands to reach for it, know where to reach it and be able to pick it up. And those are two separable systems. You can lesion one or lesion the other separately. So that's a very tiny example of where knowing something about the brain gives us some new insight into the mind that we just wouldn't get by introspection. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think that doesn't go very far into our daily life, but it's an example of how understanding how the real thing works is going to, piece by piece, little by little, over a very, very long time, going to revise our understanding of how our mind works. Well, actually, let me ask you, though, what, what, what have we learned about the mind 
um, by knowing that there's that that the action of reaching for a cup and of gazing at a cup are served by two different systems. Mm -hmm. We've learned about the underlying neural architecture of each and how they're distinct from each other. But well, but, but I meant that they're separate processes. They're right, not, but they're separate they're neural uni processes. Unified. No, no, no just process. to defend, I mean, just to be, this is the, the crux of the matter, to be clear. Yeah. What, what Ken is talking about is a form of modularity of process. He, right, exactly. Okay. Now, psychologists, yes. you know, Sternberg and many others, who have worried about the, the, the decomposition into components right. of what seems like the unified brain, you know, the, what, the, so in other words, that's not implementational level work. Yeah. In other words, showing that there's dissociation of modules, mm -hmm. showing that the seemingly unified brain mind is actually made up of these competing right. subsystems. Right. It's incredibly interesting and but that's psychology. Right. Right? It's, and then cognitive neuroscience is sort of psychology plus imaging, right? right? But but I think for the benefit of the audience, actually we might want to clarify that what we're talking about here is still actually below any level of consciousness. Um, yeah. So, so, sure. in, um, so this is about a, a, a mental process, a cognitive process, in which these two modules are distinct from each other, but one can't introspect on that at all. So that, this is, in some, some sense, what I was asking. I think many people in the, in the audience, um, would, when they hear like, questions of mind, are interested in some something that is available to introspection is consciously right. And, and I think, I, and I think and so it's very on. important. I'm sure Ken, Ken and I would take the view. I, I think that, and, and I think Dan Dennett, I was using me, made yeah. this point too. Introspection, yes, in certain circumstances, yeah. self report is useful in psychology. Right. But it's a dangerous thing right. to base science on, whether it's cognitive neuroscience with its sure. co computational modules, or whether it's neuroscience where you actually talk about implementational circuits. Right. I think there are both ways to study the brain. I think the mm -hmm. bridge, as I said, between the brain and mind is the notion of cognition. The best way to go after cognition, I think, is psychological experiments. Sometimes those psychological experiments benefit from some self-report. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very important that I do, I do not take the view that the introspective route alone, right. even I think mm -hmm. members of the audience who care about free will, consciousness, thinking, mm -hmm. would I think prefer cognitive <laughs> neuroscience to introspection. Hmm. Okay. But, but I would, the one thing I disagree is, that this isn't, the, the, the dissociation I, I just talked about is not just psychology. Uh, without, we discovered that by understanding how, the, you know, how two separate brain systems process things and how when you lesion one of them, you lose one faculty. And but that's neuropsychology. neuropsychology. But it's neuro, the neuro part. No, yeah. right. I, I'm just saying that it, if you had area A and area B and they dissociated, it's fascinating. But unless it, you cared that it was dorsal stream versus ventral stream, it could have been occipital cortex, it could have been temporal cortex. It's the dissociation that's interesting, not the exact anatomical location of it, at the current time. I, I agree with that. Yeah. 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 And so, couldn't you have the, couldn't the, the, the cognitive dissociation be at some level of explanatory removed from the neural, occur in different forms of neural location? Could, um, well, the point is we discover it by studying the brain. Yes. We don't discover it by studying the mind without studying the brain. Right. It's a lesion. I mean, uh, yes, you know, I understand. You know, I got yeah. that. It seems to me that on the one hand, we have the limits epistemologically of neural reductionism, which you made the case for very clearly. And on the other, we do have the limits of self-report, and which, which are yes. obvious. For the people who are in, in the lab doing this, do we not need a new model of science to understand the mind? Are we not stuck between bad models? I, I think, well, one thing... Um, I've found recently, and I've just a recent project, but I've been writing about um, the fact that we seem to forget the sensation of pain. And there's quite a large um, psychology and some neuroscience on this. And looking at it, um, it's interesting how so much of the neuroscience is still in. Really, I mean, because what else can we do? But maybe there's a way to think about moving forward into something else, but sp has to speak in terms, in behavioral terms. So about the two components of pain. There's the, this, there is a distinction and maybe a dissociation, though it doesn't, it's not clear that there's ever been a full dissociation between the feeling of pain and your emotional reaction. But both are 
described in terms of behavior. <laughs> They're identified in behavior. So it's very difficult just, I think, to get, it would be nice I, in, in my paper, I suggest you know, that the, um, this, the literature on memory of pain is also very confusing because it is hard to identify this sensory component outside of behavioral terms. So um, it would be nice, I think, for the science to move forward, for the neuroscience to move forward to allow for neuroscientists to feel a little bit more free about um, not needing to um, identify everything behaviorally. Of course, now, how do you do the study? You know, you have to find some thing that goes on. But, um, and this is where I think maybe first introspection and the neuroscience, the fMRI, it's gonna have to work hand in hand. Because maybe, okay, we're not gonna be able to see some behavior that uh, a subject in a study is going to events, but we're going to have to take their word for it, that they are remembering a sensation, but it's, and, and we'll look at what's going on in the brain at that point. Um, so I, I feel that in moving forward, and then just in looking at that research, I wanted to suggest that it would be um, nice to have a way to get um, subjects to identify a conscious component of what's going on versus well, what I found in the literature was the, a distinction between remembered pain and known pain. But the poor subjects in these studies, there's a, like a 500 word description of making this distinction. And I'm sure that's very difficult for any subject to read and really understand. So I thought, here I thought was a place where philosophers who like to think a lot about this subjectivity and what they call qualia and consciousness could help out in trying to create a protocol to offer to subjects in studies for them to try to identify different conscious, different as con aspects of their mind, the conscious consciousness. So in looking at what's the core, you know, what we see is correlated with um, activity in the brain. So in the, I mean, that seemed to me clear in the pain But, but even research. But in the end, you're just going to have correlations. Well, which are not explanations. So, I mean, oh, right. uh, I mean, just to get to your, your question, right? I mean, there's the meteorological uh, fallacy. You know, PMS hacker Wittgenstein has talked about. You know, wings don't fly, birds do. Okay, uh, the amygdala does not feel pain; people do. All right. So soon now, lots of again, neuroscientists don't understand that logical fallacy. Right? They think that parts feel rather than the yeah. aggregation of the parts. So there, you could say we don't need the difference. It's just because there's a philosophical misunderstanding. Okay. But on the other hand, we do lack in complexity science a br bridging hypotheses. It is true that it's difficult to hmm. come up with. If I were to ask you, do you understand New York City? Right? I could ask everyone in this room, what does that question mean? Do I understand New York City? So to understand the mind is as stupid as that question, hmm. right? <laughs> right? Do you understand yeah, New York true. City? What, what? You can utter that well, sentence, but right? But I beg to differ. Um, no one's ever asked me that question before. I've been asked the question if I understand the mind a million times. Right, just, Why? I'm just saying it's, no, it's the same finish. in kind. Let me finish. Why do neuroscientists keep making the same mistake? It's not because they don't understand the problems. It's because there's a great deal of pressure on them, social, political, human, Bless to them. make right. that leap. And so for 150 yeah. years, they keep going off the same cliff. People keep asking them, but what about the thing that I think organizes my day every day? And that's got to be related to these gray matters that you're talking about and these neurons. But how is it related? And again and again, the pressure of answering that question but I, exactly what I'm saying is a seduction. Is, I know, it's a seduction. But why don't we just get over it? In other words, we can make, I, what I'm saying is we can have very important causal connections made. Causality matters, right? Hmm. But just like explaining ant colonies and weather and cities, you can't do it by I looking at individuals. I, I completely agree so with you, but words, I'll tell you the answer. Let's just the get answer over is this. the reason we don't get over it is you won't get grants. Yeah, but that's why you won't get over yeah, it. Yeah, but that's not a very, but that's not okay. a very intellectual position I, to take. No, uh, would, tell my I'm friends gonna, in their labs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would say I'm gonna, I'm gonna like, I'm not gonna be always like, no, 
not interrupt just because I'm a woman, so I'm going to interrupt a little bit. Um, so I want to, and also I want to bring up somewhere where I think Jonathan can add. Okay, I would say things are even worse or maybe more complicated than John has just pointed out with explanation. I mean, I would say it's partly a sociological, linguistic um, fact that we say people think instead of the brain. And I think it could, I mean, we could change. I'm, I'm very um, always influenced by Chomsky on his thoughts about this. And he often points out, well, you know, in English, we say birds fly and airplanes fly. But, you know, in some other languages, airplanes don't fly. No, you know, and so it's, you know, well, in English and maybe today in most languages, we talk about people as thinking and not the brain. But, you know, that could change. I mean, it's interesting. You see also, I mean, I notice in my writing, I, I don't want an argument to state something, but a lot of people say, you know, so maybe arguments are now state. So it might be somehow also just a, a social fact also. I'm not sure. I mean, I'm willing to say there's some uh, flexibility in what we take as a fact of the matter in this case. I, well, yeah, I would agree entirely. I think it is. I knew you'd have it. I think it's very much a social fact. But also, you, um, um, with an interesting history, I mean, the mind body problem goes, you know, goes, goes all the way back. And, and people have written interesting things about it for a very long time. And, um, and it has affected our culture in recent years in ways that are, you know, I guess good and bad. Um, and certainly, our, and, our, and our arts in ways that are interesting. There's um, good novels have been written about. You know, brain-based accounts of behavior and uh, and psychology. Uh, Ian McEwan Saturday's a lovely novel. Hmm. But the science is wrong, uh, um, <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> um, but uh, um, but is preoccupied with you know the problem of reducing experience to uh, to to the brain. But also, actually, I think even in everyday speech, again, going way back, um, you you will pick up phrases like you know my brain hurts or something like that when you're talking about like a, having to think really hard about a problem. The notion that the brain is the seat of the mind and is involved in cognition um, has been, you know, obvious in one way or another to, for people for a very long time. And uh, and there's all sorts of kind of like folk cultural ways of making the connections pretty quick. Um, and uh, none of that, I think, poses any problems for your fundamental irritation with your own discipline, though. I think that it's actually quite compatible <laughs> with it. Um, there's in the sense that they're not doing any explanatory work. Um, but it's a, but it's part of the culture in which people will refer to the br the brain as a kind of chunky way of talking about you know the mind. Yeah, I mean, it, it, if, if you're just you know in, in an article we wrote last year, you know, involved in cognition, mm -hmm. that word involved does mm -hmm. no work. Yeah. It's just a correlation or better a causal link, right. which none, no one doubts, right? In other words, if you're doing causal work, manipulative right. interventional work. Right. That's great science. Right. I mean, we do, you know, but it's a, it's going to be more difficult when you say, "Hey, how does the how does the brain lead to the mind?" And, and I'm going to go, and you're going, "Ah, oh, thank right. you. I'm not going to have to worry about that again. Yeah. I've had my aha moment. Yeah. It's a nice compressed sentence has been uttered. Yeah. I've understood. Just the way if you say, "How does a car engine work?" I think I know how a car engine works. I want there to be a way to say how the brain leads to the mind. Sure. And what I'm saying is it's not going to ever sound like the way you're being told yep. how a car engine mm -hmm. works. Yep. And you just have to live with that. Yeah, yeah, no, right? no, no, no. And, I, 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 and I'm just saying that most people, I think, intuit it better than the reductionist oh, yeah, scientists. I, again, I agree entirely with that. Yeah. I, do, I also think that there are cultural reasons and political reasons uh, along the lines of what George is suggesting as to why this conversation now in 2018 seems so pressing. Um, uh, at least in, in my experience over the last decade, universities and funding agencies and, uh, and, and everything else have become preoccupied with two things in particular, uh, neurological reduction and what you might call kind of um, data or computational reduction. So. Yes. Uh, the money is in either, you know, kind of information systems and studying, uh, uh, using computers to sort of provide numbers for things, or it is, an, as you suggested, George, and, you know, giving up, putting a, like a squiggly F in front of something or just generally using the word neuron. And that's an interesting sociological question. 
Yeah, there's a wonderful mm -hmm. book, if, it, if anyone's interested, called Neuro, right. published by Princeton University Press, I think about five years ago, by two writers, where they very, very, they beautifully outline the sociology of the neuro fad. Right. And, and they very much link it to what they call the neuromolecular view of the right, mind, right. which very much came on the heels of molecular biology and molecular genetics. Mm -hmm. So the hubris was that we've solved DNA, right. makes RNA, makes protein. We're going to do this for neuroscience. Complete failure, obviously. Yeah, but nevertheless, it was very compelling. The mm -hmm. Caltech story, uh, uh, Mary McKay wrote a history of Caltech and how Linus Pauling said that when we studied proteins, we would extrapolate from proteins. Mm -hmm, yeah. So this has happened over and over again, this sort of extrapolation hubris, right. right? And now the current one isn't neurons, it's not genes, it's circuits. Yes, exactly. This nauseating word that you hear over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Now, it's not again, it's not that so it isn't networks, useful work. Which right? is also a kind of a neuro term as well. Yeah, it, it's yeah. just that it, 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 there's underlying this good work, there's this additional mm -hmm. strange totemic view that this will be what gets us to the promised land, right? right? And it's bizarre. So I, I, get, I get to where I don't quite know what we're talking about, but... Um. Well, I think it's what people, people really wanted to know, whether the things that we talk about as mind will ever be sub-explained. And, okay, so, so to address... That's what it's about. So, mm -hmm. I'm saying not at the level of, not at the level of neural circuits. So, so there's, there's, there's different things there. So, for example, I mean, to understand New York City in its totality? Yeah. No, but we can understand a lot, and we can understand more and more, and we can understand why, you know, why are the traffic patterns the way they are? We can understand the forces that lead to that. We can, there's a lot you can understand without saying that you ever grasp the whole thing. But the work, and like, it seems to me you're saying if we no, can't no, grasp no, the whole thing, it's more subtle. It's more subtle than that. When you look at work on cities, for example, Jeffrey West, the former president of the Santa Fe Institute, has written a wonderful book, which I highly recommend, called Scale, where he mm -hmm. talks about how the complexity of cities arises. Complexity science does have ways of producing explanations about aggregate behavior. But it is non-reductionist science. What I'm saying is, when you talk about complexity, you can find reduced forms of explanation to discuss complex systems. Okay. But no one's going to talk about galaxy formation by talking about particle physics. Right? It's a different discipline. But all I'm saying is, is you, of course you can study cities. The Santa Fe Institute's been studying cities for ages. But what they wouldn't say is to understand cities study one family. There's, look, there's, of course there's many, many levels. And the very bottom level doesn't give a good explanation of the top level. And, but that's what the but neuroscientists think. I, I don't think so. I, not, I don't see that myself. Um, I think in popular culture and popular writing, there's a lot of that. I don't see it really in, in neuroscientists myself. Um, but but so just to say another thing. So you were talking about, you know, what people want to know is the mind they experience, their consciousness, mm -hmm. basically. Um, from my point of view, that's, you know, literally the tip of the iceberg. Oh, of course. And, and the, you know, the iceberg being all the stuff that goes on in the brain. It's not literally the tip of the iceberg, though. <laughs> As the English professor, I've thought I've been guilty. Um, the, uh, and, and the reason why that matters is because what we experience, you know, has a lot of structure that we don't understand, that we try to get at by introspection, by meditation, by all kinds of means. But a lot of that structure comes from all the stuff that's beneath the surface and not conscious. And so I don't, to me, to understand the mind, to understand the conscious mind is a tiny piece of that. Mm -hmm. And it's not the central question, really, although... For ourselves personally, we'd like that's what we'd like to know because that's what we experience. But right. but we're not going to understand that without understanding this huge amount of substructure and all the many 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 levels from the bottom to the top. That's a very very long project, but it's not that we're never going to get any insight. I mean, now the, the one thing that I would sort of agree with, or maybe I don't know if you're saying this, John, but I don't think we're ever going to have a scientific explanation of why 
the operations of the brain and the mind and all of their structure that leads us to act in the ways we act, why that's accompanied by subjective experience, mm -hmm. why that's why we have a conscious experience, why we're not zombies, that whole philosophical right. question. I don't think that's a scientific question. I don't think we're ever going to answer that. We, we experience that when our mind does these things, they enter consciousness, we have a subjective awareness of them. But if you take away the subjective awareness part and just take all of the processing, all of the, all of the things that go on by which our brain is associating ideas and understanding things about the world and leading us to act in certain ways, um, then I don't see why we can't ultimately understand that in terms of the brain. I, you know, for example, I mean, it, it, the problem is we're at such an early stage. I mean, yeah. you know, at the time of Aristotle, if you wanted to understand why water felt wet, you know, you really didn't have the means. So somebody could say, we're never going to understand that in physical terms. Well, now we, we uh, you know, any way you can describe the property of wetness, we have an explanation in terms of quantum mechanics and, and, and atoms and hydrogen bonds. We have explanations of why it has all the properties of wetness. But in Aristotle's time, that was totally out of reach. But it didn't mean it was out of reach in principle. But I think we're in Aristotle's time so in terms of neuroscience. No, just, just one. I don't agree, actually, about the subjective experience bit. I actually feel that. Uh, a red herring. I think, as Wittgenstein again pointed out, it's amazing that you decide to move your arm and it goes up. It's amazing that you get touched and you feel it. So I actually think, like Nicholas Humphrey has written, that actually knowing where your limb is in space when you close your eye is probably on the way to subjective conscious experience. And he, make, he has a lovely argument of that kind. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that you keep using the word understand. And what I'm saying, Ken, is you remove causal relations from that word. What does it mean? It means mm. understanding the substructure. No, don't use understanding to explain understanding. It, it, no, uh, it means understanding the, the substructure that leads to the structure. Leads, but what, does, what does leads do? Is that causality? It, it's getting a deeper but you understanding keep, of how the pieces but are But you can't together. keep going back to that word. I'm just saying is, but, but what does what it mean? What if it's causality? Uh, um, if, if you're, what I'm saying is that in the philosophy of science, and the words explain and understand and cause are not the same thing, or predict. Like when a sycamore leaf is dropped, we know the physics of the movement of a sycamore leaf, but it's extremely difficult to predict what its trajectory is going to be. Mm -hmm. right? And similarly, you can have converse situations where you can predict but not understand things. Okay. All I'm saying is the problem here is that you're using the word understanding. When you say, why is that woman crying? It's because she's sad. That's an explanation, and you go, I now understand why she's crying. Causality is not in there, in the scientific sense. All I'm saying is, is that understanding isn't synonymous with causality. And as soon as one goes after a scientist, like I'm going after you, mm -hmm. to remove any causal sounding words from your sentences, you're left bereft, right? And that's what I'm saying is what's so difficult about this. Well, so to me, it's a matter of... of, of these things, I mean, there's very, very complicated structure underlying it. And the more... But underlying another filler word. And you, and you gain words. insight. It's not, again, it's not, it's not a total understanding. But you gain insight the more you understand the structure underneath the surface. I mean, a body of correlations is not nothing. I think that's what you mean. You gain more and more and more correlations. They and, aren't causal. And I think also, um, perhaps John is also suggesting that there's a kind of implied level of priority if you use the image of you know, an iceberg and everything that lies below it, or the, or the interest in kind of digging deeper to get to what's seeming more real at, at some more fundamental level. And I think part of perhaps what you're suggesting, John, is that that there's that's a kind of mistake because we um, the the because there's it's hard to figure out any kind of causality and so therefore it's actually not more fundamental. But you required. can do causality. I mean, don't you can, well, depletion well, causes Parkinson's sure, disease. Sure, of course. And, we and know I said, that. I think, yes, exactly. We don't understand also, Parkinson's well, disease. Well, you can also say that you know an, whatever event let's, that this poor woman had in her life before she started crying had some causal relationship to her crying in a way that we could say is you know we can understand in some scientific fashion, perhaps though not just in terms, of, we wouldn't be in the language of neuroscience. That'd be in the language of hmm. psychology or sociology. Events in one's life that have an effect on your emotions, right? That's not outside of science, I don't think, is it? No, I'm, I'm just it's saying... It's just that science is not neuroscience. I, 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 right, I'm just saying that there are, as, you know, as Janet, intentional levels, there are words that do explain yes. them, that mean things. Hmm. And all I'm saying is that 
if you want it to sound like an explanation or understanding yeah. by dropping down to work that is doing good correlational causal work right. and want it to also give you, along with its correlational causal truth, right. the feeling of explanation or understanding, in addition, when you subtract yeah. away the correlational causality, right. we don't have a way of doing no, that. No, and I agree entirely. So, I mean, you could say that in some ways that there's a, just a dependency relationship between these levels of explanation. You can't have one without the other. We're not going to have crying people who have no brains, right? Um, Nevertheless, there, uh, that the, the explanation that's going to be sat that's going to satisfy the question of whether why is this woman crying is, sim is this simply not going to be done at some lower level of dependency that needs to be there, but that doesn't do any explanatory causal work, right? It does, right? It, yeah. it, it, it's, it's, and I don't have tend to, I don't claim I know the answer. I'm just saying that I don't think we should fool ourselves with these words right. hmm. and well, use them. Hmm. Well, philosophers of science have spent a lot of time arguing about what it means to be an explanation and to have understanding, and they've come to no answers on this, and they have, or no understanding. But some of them, like Nathan Salmon, he did argue that yeah. an explanation is just providing a cause. Boss von Frossen, one of my favorite, he um, says an explanation is an answer to a why question. Right, exactly. So it's sort of a social thing also when we stop sort of asking the question. Maybe we have the explanation. Um, now, Ken, I wanted to say you're just really not, you know, being um, bold enough, I would say. Um, I mean, another, I am, another thing that Boss von Frossen says that I like to quote quite often, um, so, you know, okay, he says, there are no science stoppers. And I really believe that. I mean, well, yes, from our perspective now, consciousness, subjective experience, that's beyond the ken, but, you know, why, who knows? I mean, how can we, at our point, really, I mean, there have been such major um, turnovers in science, but we couldn't have predicted at all in the past, maybe in the future, we will stop you know, wondering why consciousness, why are we subjective, and it will just be something that seems somehow we've come up with some psychologically satisfying answer to it. Um, now, of course, there's the other certain science stoppers do exist in terms of grant money. You know, maybe it's not reasonable to be giving a lot of money right now to the neuroscientists studying subjectivity because we're nowhere close enough. But in principle, What's why, like, sort of say absolutely not? Isn't it useful to leave open, except for maybe economic reasons? Um, so, okay, the, I don't think it's really the most important question to worry about. But the the reason I say that is what science does. I mean, we we start with subjective experience of an objective world. What science does is it isolates the things that are objectively reproducible, objectively definable, operationally definable. And so you can, I, I believe consciousness science, consciousness neuroscience is a real field because, but it has to do with understanding what brain processes and what brain systems are, are active in what ways when you are versus are not conscious, when you do versus don't consciously perceive something. It's, it's knowing you know, ultimately, hopefully, we will completely be able to say by observing, you know, the brain uh, whether someone was conscious of a certain thing or not. I, I think that's totally in reach. What I don't think is in reach is to say why there's a subjective experience associated with it, because all that science can talk about is the objective processes underlying it. Or how, well, or how you no. get from these objective processes but, to this objective experience, yeah, not just why. I'm okay. impressed that you know what science can do. Maybe that's what it can do today, but come on. Look at what, what Aristotle would have said. All this was what science can do. He would have really had a much different, you know, none of what we are doing today would have he said. But, I mean... Uh, well, let, Prediction let me, let me, is difficult, especially I, I about we, the future. I, 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 think we might, I think we might someday have an explanation that, that makes us satisfied and stop worrying about it. You know, so that to say when, when this subsystem of the brain acts in, the, you know, in this way, it makes the brain imagine that it's experiencing something and that's consciousness. You know, and you could imagine that we will tell ourselves a story that will satisfy ourselves and will be 100% correlated with when you're conscious and when you're not. That's different from saying why, why dead matter has subjective experience. 
That's just that we can get a satisfying explanation, but that's a different issue. Uh, I think it's an important one, though. I think it might, it might seem terminological and not that interesting, but, but what's happened over time was when neuroscience says that's not a scientific question and subjectivity and consciousness have gotten that treatment, it ends up flipping over into mysticism and religion. Usually there's a great deal of pressure for it to flip over into religion and mysticism. So I think it's easy to say this is part of the natural world. We probably need a different way of thinking about science and different technological kind of advances to uh, be able to master this, but the problems don't go away. And one of the central problems, subjectivity, is if you think of it as an epiphenomenon, it's not very interesting, but if you think of intention and top-down regulation as critical to human behavior and to expand it outward to the ant in a colony, to political life, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If you think all of that is critical, then you don't want to walk away from it as potentially open to reliable and valid knowledge, aka science. I don't walk away from any of that. It's only, you know, any objective process you can put a name on, intentionality, you Yeah, any, any objective process you can put a name on, I think we can investigate. It's just why that objective process is not, you know, look, when a computer program as compl complicated as we can make it today, I think we all feel confident does not have any subjective experience. A car engine, I think we all feel confident does not have any subjective experience. So you keep adding more and more and more complexity to the matter, and, and at some point the matter has subjective experience. I think we can talk about all the complexity of the matter, all the processing it does, we can talk about which of them are associated with subjective experience, but the fact that, that the, you know, the, 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 the dead meat acquires subjective experience, how do you, there, there isn't a, that's a, that's a fact, it's a phenomenon. Well, that's well I, 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 I think I recognize, we, we you're might. recognizing that it's a paradox. How do we have an objective science I mean, of subjectivity? I, I honestly, I which feel... Which is a real that, problem. That, that, <laughs> uh, I, I, I just, I mean... There's a lot more that's concerning about understanding the link between mind and brain than this old sore of subjectivity and consciousness. I mean, it's... I, 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 it I, I, I No, because, I, because unfortunately, I mean, I think one has to distinguish. It's extremely important to distinguish between making statements about science never getting somewhere. I think you're totally right. And I, at no point was I trying to say that. Mm -hmm. Versus logical, conceptual errors that are being made and being mistaken for lack of scientific progress. And all I'm saying is they're not the same. There's a lot of logical conceptual error in the way we think about these questions that is invariant to how far we are along in terms of our technologies and our techniques. Of course we don't know. And actually, when it comes to the subjectivity argument, that's actually where I don't think it's such a big deal. I think it's a big hmm. deal because of us posing it. We give special status to subjectivity over pain, over proprioception, but that's cultural. I actually think this obsession with conscious subjectivity is a cultural bias more than a difference in kind. And I just want, I hope, this is a complex discussion, that understanding things like language, pain, movement, attention, all of those are difficult to know what the right level of analysis is. Right. Do we do psychological modules? Do we do circuits? Do we do neurons? I'm trying to say that all those areas that aren't the sexy area of consciousness and of subjectivity are all still in play in terms of we're not, we're not sure what the level of granularity is to do the work. Right. That's what I'm saying. It's true in all areas, even movement. Right. Um, and, and, and all I'm saying is at the moment in neuroscience, we've got this reductionist turn where we feel like if we can play God on small circuits, which we can, it's remarkable what we can do now on small circuits. Mm -hmm. it, we are like gods, right? Mm -hmm. Has led to a kind, in my view, premature belief that this is going to be extrapolated to be as good as what our current psychological functional explanations look like. Right. So you're so that's the point. I'm making so a more so global so, point. Right. So, so if I understand what you're saying now, you're, the the complaint or the concern about reduction, reducing subjectivity is, for you at least, less of a concern or is a red herring in the way of actually what you're really worried about, which is reducing uh, um, uh, and being kind of a, a sort of neurological greediness um, at other levels of the mind which aren't even conscious, actually. That's correct. And, okay. it's just, and, and what we're really dealing with is how are we going to do neuroscience versus psychology? Right. 
One is functional, one is mechanistic. Yep. And that's a genuinely difficult bridging question. Yes. And that's true across the board. Right. And I think that there's a tendency to believe that we will, even for complex cognitive phenomena, be able to explain right. away some of our functional designations yes, exactly. with lower level ones. Right. And at the current time, that has not succeeded. Right. Now, whether there's some well, breakthrough, we shall see. But that's right. my concern. But, but, but that's, so now we're agreeing, because as I said, we're, you know, we're centuries or, or millennia away from those kind of connections. But that's different from saying, in principle, it can't be done, which is what I thought you were saying. No, I wasn't, saying, I, I wasn't saying principle. I was saying I want to distinguish between what is still open to being discovered versus right. what is a illogical kind of framework to begin with that needs to just be dismantled a little bit. It's, it's like saying one day we'll understand the ether. There is no ether, right? And what, what I'm saying is we just, I, I, I want to say that there are lots of philosophical, logical mistakes at work today, which by the way, the muriological fallacy that Hacker talks about, Aristotle was the one who first came up with the idea that it's not the, the idea that the part is doing what the whole is doing. Mm -hmm. Aristotle was the first one to point that out, and he's correct up until this day. Mm -hmm. Wings don't fly, birds do. Mm -hmm. right. the amygdala does not the amygdala does not feel pain. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. well, uh, the, the, you could say the heart doesn't pump blood, a person does. No, I think we all feel comfortable saying the heart pumps blood. You could say, you know, the brain doesn't think the person does. Well, that's because we identify the person with what with, with what the brain does. So in that sense, we feel more comfortable saying the person thinks, but it, Actually, it's, I, it's I, sensible to say the brain without thinks. Without the amygdala, you wouldn't feel the pain. Yeah, but you, without pain sensors in your periphery, you wouldn't. wouldn't so are they feeling pain in your skin? That's not, that's not the question. Though. No, I'm, I'm saying of we course. don't consider your skin as feeling pain. We don't. Right. Sure you do when you burn your hand. No, your you, skin is you, no, no, it's not. But it's not your skin. <laughs> feeling, it's not your skin feeling pain. And then why do we say my skin hurts? Right, because we're very subject to this muriological fallacy, which Aristotle first pointed out. We well, ascribe. There's, there's an importance to that because we start with saying it's my. I just burnt my finger. My finger is therefore hurting. And out of that observation comes a series of other development and progress that gets us to the point where you can say, this part and these circuits and this and that got us to the fact that now I'm perceiving this part. But those are just, those are causal so there is a, there, there is a, in, in terms of worrying about subjectivity and the consciousness, there is a gain at the end, just as there is a gain about understanding any of the so Interesting facts the and causalities that we gathered along the way. What I'm saying is that the answers aren't of the form of the original question. <laughs> Why is the government interested in bar Well, it's, 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 well, there was a leader, Tom Insel, who was the head of the NIMH, and he had a very narrow view. I think he, he would have benefited from a conversation with you about the epistemologic problems of neuroscience, and he felt that we were wasting our time looking for correlations, wasting our time doing clinical research that didn't have clear biomarkers or neural circuits. These were the two, these are the two big terms. And so he mandated, kind of from the top down, that uh, any grant that would be coming to the NIMH must make a claim about a biomarker or a neural circuit that was underlying it in a causal manner. Now, in psychiatry, we have none. So that puts researchers in a rather strange position. They have to make something up. Mr. Insult, a Dr. Insult, has gone to Google, where no doubt he's doing very well. He's left, actually. He, he left Google already? He left the company, yeah. Mm. Okay, but the NIMH, to this date, we don't know. They have a new director. We'll see if they, they continue with this. Whether they do or not, it is, you know, a, a really made manifest the way uh, uh, science be, can become epistemologically uh, unsound and ideological, essentially. Mm -hmm. This was essentially ideology. It wasn't yep. science. And it's, it's really going to hamper research. The irony was the great victory of Tom Insel's NIMH came out as he was on his way out the door. It was a five-year study that showed that early intervention with young people who were psychotic with psychotherapy and family support and medication le led to better outcomes. It was a study that n could not have been done with a biomarker or a neural circuit. So his greatest victory 
actually seem to imply that uh, he should not have made these decisions, but it's presently the, the law of the land at the NIMH, mm -hmm. as far as I understand. Maybe I'll say if it's okay. Okay, I mean, I also, in my research, I also, and, and I'm writing a book, really, why we need to move beyond this problem, actually, of just the subjectivity and consciousness, actually. So, mind without matter. We don't need to be thinking now about that relationship. But I just have to say something about this, still, this idea that there's this insuperable um, problem about science is objective and that consciousness is subjective. Well. You know, no one also, as philosophers, no philosopher has been able to explain what that means to say science is objective. It's very difficult um, to say what that exactly means. So it's um, not, it sounds like there's a problem, but it's not clear what that problem is at all, if there is a problem. Um, so I wouldn't take that as a, well, okay, we're never going to get there because we have science as objective and... We don't really know what that means. I mean, just to, to defend Ken a little bit about, just so you don't think I'm anti-circuit. I mean, these are subtle issues. But if you look at the, Sherrington's work on the stretch reflex, so in other words, Sherrington mm -hmm. at the end of the 19th, early 20th century was very interested in the loop between the sensation and the reflex, you know, the mm -hmm. knee jerk that everyone says. And we do have a mechanistic understanding that goes beyond correlation or causation. I mean, when you talk about understanding in science. It's about this object pushing on that object and moving it. It's about interaction between things. Although not in physics, because they don't even talk about causality well, well, in physics. Well, well, the, well, I mean, quantum mechanics is, is a causal to yeah. a degree, but that's not true at the, at the meso level they do, right? Mm -hmm. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is you can say, and Sherrington did, that this is a stimulus that hits the 1A afferent, it goes and it makes a monosynaptic connection to the motor neuron, which then innovates the muscle. And that is really nice. It's, it's just the kind of work that we like. And then you look at eye movements. There's a very famous engineer at Hopkins called David Robinson who beautifully integrated eye movements with the circuitry underlying them in the brainstem and a mathematical model. There was an isomorphic click between the model, the anatomy, and the behavior. So there are beautiful successes in neuroscience where you do get the perfect link between the circuit, the behavior, and a computational model. The problem is, is can we repeat that success when it comes to what we all call the mind or cognition? When I mentioned Janelia at the beginning of, of this session, they say, look, what if we find the cognitive primitive that is the equivalent of the stretch reflex or an eye movement, mm. but it's not about the sensory motor. We'll move those out. It's about that decision in between. Right, that it's, a, it's the cognitive decision that is invariant to whether you decide to pick up the apple because you saw it, you smelled it, you can use your mouth, you can use your hand. The decision is invariant to the sensory stimulus and to the effector. And if we could just understand the cognitive equivalent of the stretch reflex, we're on our way. Right? Mm -hmm. And we have the technology now that Sherrington didn't have and David Robinson didn't have. Mm -hmm. We can move beyond the sensory motor. That's what's going on. And what I'm saying is, is there's a possibility, just like we're seeing with deep mind, we don't know what all those synaptic weights are doing, that when it gets to cognition of the form we're interested in, it won't be that clicky little isomorphic feeling that eye movements and stretch reflex have. That's the big dilemma, is will we be able to extrapolate? Because even for the stretch reflex, we haven't been able to extrapolate to motor cortex. We still don't know mm. what motor cortex does, and we've wow. had the stretch reflex for 100 years. Oh my gosh. So I'm just voicing a little bit of skepticism about the simple version and then scaling it up. But, but again, it's, there's a question of, in principle, is it you know, impossible, or is it, are we just way premature? And you know, just as another example, I mean, you know, memory. So, so we, that's a psychological process, and from neuropsychology, but the neuro was critical, we've discovered it breaks up into pieces, right? There's the episodic memory, and there's the short-term uh, working memory, and there's the short-term and long-term episodic memory, and the ways those... But that's psychology. That's neuropsychology. But, but we didn't, and that separates... I love that stuff. And that separates from procedural and memory. And there's not agreement. We, we never knew, they don't have agreement about that. No, but we, knew, we never <laughs> knew any of those things separated until there was HM, right? So, and, and, H until there was oh. a guy who lost his ability to make new episodic memories. Yeah. 
That's, well, that, that, that research, stuff. though, is though also, I, I think we can't talk about that research after you have you read the journalist's book about the research on HM. I yeah, don't think it's, yeah, we can't talk about it anymore. <laughs> well, no, it was done, yeah. it, it was like. No, no, I mean, you're talking about, you know, the ethics of how it was yeah. done. I'm just talking about the results. Right. I mean, we can maybe separate yeah. Well, even there. All right, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to turn it. But my point was that a psychological process starts to break up into pieces we were not aware of that give us insight. Oh, I love that and, stuff. And that's never going to stop. We're never going to stop breaking it up into pieces that are we didn't know about and that are going to give us insight into how it works and give us more and more power to manipulate. There's no disagreement there. Um, you know, you know, the neuropsychological decomposition into modules is not the same as circuit implementational neuroscience. They're not They're, they're, the they're same. related. You know? Well, okay, but that's, you know, so are third cousins. <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn to the audience. Uh, please come to the microphone for asking any questions that you may have. You know, why in principle shouldn't there be limits to what we can know? I'm thinking of you know, evolution. Obviously, you know, a, a monkey can't know answer these questions. Yeah. And if you think of evolution, our brains have evolved to deal with everyday life. I'm assuming evolution hasn't stopped. There's something species have come along with brains bigger than ours and can't yeah. figure out why we can't understand That's, things. Yeah. So why, it seems obvious to me that there are questions we're yeah. going to be able to answer. Well, that's a good question. I mean, I would say we shouldn't take there to be in principle science stoppers. Why? <coughs> say you can't do it. It's not useful psychologically, you know, from a, from a um, psychological perspective. Like, since we don't know. We, so, so yes, of course, our brains are a certain size. We have certain resources. There are going to be limits. But why say we can't, right now, we're at a point where we can't, because in the past we've seen so many times where um, scientists have said, oh, we've figured it all out now, this is, a, or, you know, this is something we can never figure out, and we have after time. Not so, these questions. Well, um, if you define where you're spending your money, you should do where you think you can have the most chance of yes, success. Yes, so there, that's what I so, said. There are, uh, practical, there are practical reasons, so maybe, for, you know, this is why maybe it's a argument since some people want the money and they're trying to argue for it so that you know that's a reasonable <coughs> argument but I don't think we are um, can predict the future well enough given how much science has changed in the past it's going to change in the future too I think to say this is one area where it's we're absolutely certain will not make progress so but I don't think yes. anyone's saying I, that. I think there's another. There's, no one said that. The, well, but the, yeah, there's another answer, which is that this isn't just about pure science. It's about pragmatic problems. You know, as a psychiatrist, if someone comes to me and I take the epistemological standards that we've been talking about today, I'd say, I really have no idea. I have no idea about almost anything at this level of certainty and causal certainty. And yet, here is a person who needs help. So I have to try to think in a very dirty way, from a scientific point of view, about what's pragmatically and what you know what's pragmatically effective. What kind of correlations exist? What things mm -hmm. like my experience have shown me that give me some sort of dirty attempt to try to help this person. So I think that's just one experience. I think there's a whole array of other pragmatic reasons why saying this isn't unanswerable leads to, it doesn't have to lead to fake answers. It can lead to hypotheses that you know are not confirmed, that are working hypotheses that help you work through a problem. Right. Yeah. That doesn't, why would someone study consciousness, for instance? I don't think there's any it's just sort of a human knowledge benefit. And I, for me, that's an obvious one where we're not going to have an answer. It's, I, it's I impossible. Well, well, again, we're going to have lots of answers about uh, what neural processes happen when you are and aren't conscious. But, so there's, we'll have certain kinds of answers. And, yeah, it, well, of course. And also, I mean, why study consciousness? Um, I mean, there's several, there's different ways in which one can study consciousness. I mean, since consciousness is actually available for introspection, it is something we all experience um, because it is experience. Um, it certainly is available for all kinds of investigation and explanation of a, just of a different sort than, um, than you might have with respect to its, you know, neural substructure. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, 
Um, and why do it? Well, because actually it's the world in which we all live. I mean, uh, it was something we, we, if we, that we all care deeply about because it's, um, it's our, something we are intimately familiar with from waking up to going to sleep. So, um, so certain jettisoning consciousness as if it's irrelevant seems to basically leave behind the entire world. Um, and, uh, and, you know, who'd want, who'd want to do that? Um, uh, so, like, you know, it could be either the science of correlations, like you were describing, you know, the, the, the whole neural correlate problem, uh, program, which I think has, you know, been underway for a while now, and, or it could be some other form of phenomenological science, where actually you really look hard on, you know, on your, on your own experiences, and those are the reports of others. And also you don't know what type of spin-offs it might have. With pure research now, we don't really know what these correlations mm -hmm. would do. You don't know what type of... And if people are motivated, if there's some people that are interested, well, then they'll probably work really hard and maybe, you know, do some, do some good research. Okay. I have a wonderful scientist, um, at MIT, Harvard, Emery Brown, who's done some fascinating work on, you know, the differences between being under anesthesia and versus being asleep, for example, and being sedated, and doing what Ken was talking about, very interesting differences in the subcomponent neuroanatomy and physiological processes versus, you know, where you're asleep, sedated, or under anesthesia of different kinds. So there's wonderful basic work being done in hospitals where patients are being put under anesthesia. It's, in fact, Emery Brown's work, to me, is some of the nicest work showing how you can do, in parallel, mechanistic, modular work and work that's going to be important for patients. Uh, the, the, the problem with translation, I mean, there's a wonderful paper that came out last year by Unidas and Joyner at how little of what the NIH has funded has translated. And one of the reasons they put forward is because it's this horrible reductionist neuromolecular program mm -hmm. that we're going to solve disease one molecule at a time, one gene at a time. And actually, if you notice now, many people are considerably less sanguine now about what they think this is going to lead to. Um, the former head of the NIH, I'm blanking on his name now, he was interviewed recently, Dr. Thomas Insel. No, I mean, he was saying, you know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of genes associated with all these things, and we haven't got the slightest clue what to do about it. Um, now, when it comes to things like diabetes, hypertension, stroke, heart disease, and, you know, obesity, cigarette smoking, opioid addiction, you know, these chronic lifelong conditions that require behavioral intervention, we're very bad because we want a delta function. We want a pill or a surgery, or a zap. Mm -hmm. The idea, and, and just for you to understand the absurdity of it, if I had said to you, take this pill, sir, swallow it, and you'll be an expert pianist. <laughs> right? Take this pill, and you don't need to go to college. All four years of college have been compressed into this pill. You'd rightly go, there's something nonsensical about that. Mm -hmm. But once you get to medicine, switch you being healthy and taking a pill to be an expert violinist or pianist, but take this pill and we'll cure your multiple sclerosis, your Alzheimer's. Hmm. That suddenly makes more sense. Hmm. Right? It, it, it's very... Right. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is it's hmm. going to turn out that we're going to have to do a lot more human behavioral modular work than mouse models of Alzheimer's. Now, I'm not against them. Because mm -hmm. like, I do think there'll be pharmacological interventions. I do mouse studies. But again, you're totally correct that there is an equivalent fallacy in medicine of a reductionist kind, just like there is in neuroscience, hmm. right? That we're going to solve diseases, one drug, one molecule, one gene at a time. And if you look at these papers by Unities and others, it's been, for the most part, a failure. Now, I'm going to get into lots of trouble saying that, but I'm just quoting them. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the other, um, you know, sort of pie-in-the-sky translational... Uh, outcome of studying um, consciousness um, through neuroscience, of course, would have to do with end-of-life issues, whether when a patient's in a coma. So you need to, you know, how, I mean, it's a lot Coma's of compl another one that you need complicated issues here. Do we, is this over? Is there anything worth living for? You know, is, is if there is subjective consciousness, does that make life, you know, so it's a very complicated um, thing to think about that requires a lot of interdisciplinary thought, but that could be, you know, in principle, a possible a translational um, issue. 
Hey, this is a question that Sam Harris addresses, I mm. think, in the book Consciousness, but don't mm -hmm. hold me to that. Um, if we can never understand this subject, or if it's a long way off, you never say never, either, either yeah. way pattern you, uh, you want to go by, how can we be responsible for our actions? Mm. Um, well, I, um, I'm not sure if I actually see the connection, to be honest. I mean, um, uh, yeah, your question is the perfect question mm -hmm. because it's exactly it's the perfect question because it's exactly the way not to think about these things. We're talking about a social, psychological legal, being that legal. we call the you. Yeah. When we talk about, you know, is the brain deterministic or you know where where does that choice live neurally? That's a whole nother level that I don't think we have well, any good, clear answers to. I, I but mean, it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, when we talk, it's a practical matter. We talk about people being responsible in part because we're either trying to, you know, cause interventions to change their behavior or cause interventions to lock them away so they don't bother us again. Or we're, we're doing things in the human world on the basis of morality and responsibility. And the fact that things are, have physical causes is, is at a whole completely different level. And Jonathan, I'm sure, could mm -hmm. talk about this far better. I mean, it's more 19th century than 18th century. But the sort of medicalization of, you know, behavioral states, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, homosexuality, for example, it, it went from being a legal issue to being the most medicalized issue. Everyone had a theory about this, right? And I'm saying that the equivalent of this medicalization of things that shouldn't be medicalized, I think, in a way, neuroscience is doing the same thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's walking over areas it should not be trespassing on. Hmm. I would, okay, I, wait, I need to say something, because I, I would say it's not the exact wrong question. I think there is an issue here. And I do think as society, in courts of law, and it does, sometimes we do take away responsibility when we find an underlying physical cause. And I think this is something that it's a very, you know, I mean, we can't, I think we're not going to always say it's just the person, we always have free will, but it's a very delicate balance, and we have to um, think about it carefully, and you know, just make sure that, I mean, I, I, yeah, sometimes we do take it away. But it's a mistake. Um, I don't know if it's always a mistake. Uh, well, well, but I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not no always a mistake. In kind from sometimes the, it makes sense, I think, to take it away. It's no different in kind from the, the you know, the question, am I responsible if my childhood experience you know, let me down this path. It's, it's just, it's right. the same it's, question. And it's a difficult I mean, look, question. There, a you have to question, take into nothing. so many issues. Yeah, <laughs> it's a similar, we don't have a solution that right. one way or the also, other, and, it's and, complicated. And it also depends in part of, to go to back to Bas, to Baslan Vrasen's mm -hmm. language, like what question you're asking. So there's a, like for example, the, they just, uh, sure, uh, John and Ken read the article in today or yesterday's Times about the brain of the shooter in Las Vegas. They, yeah. you know, they yeah, went, and they I sliced see. it, diced it, looked at it, you know, um, and uh, they came up with that. No, nothing. We can't tell anything that's different about this brain that would explain it. <laughs> I know, it. but um, <laughs> I know it's, uh, but, it's painful. But even if yeah. they had, yeah, I mean, but right. my point in the my point is both to kind of yet another example of neuromania, but also, but also because uh, if because if you think about what they were asking, it was not. If we actually found some sort of uh, underlying, you know, uh, abnormality that would explain the recent, you know, that would explain the atrocity, that we would then therefore excuse him for it in retrospect, it's more like, would this provide an account of the, you know, the change in behavior that led up to a, an atrocity that he would, if he had survived, still be put in jail for? I think that's a reasonable question. Um, I, that's a, it's a question different, however, from a legal question. And I think sometimes they often get confused. And I think that, and especially when you bring in something as, you know, as, uh, as difficult as free will talk, it, it then just becomes a, a mess. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we would love to keep them separated. It's much easier to say mm -hmm. the moral, political, social world is dominated by notions of free will. We need to operate that way. And mm -hmm. we work at the level of biological mm -hmm. determinism that doesn't really correspond to that. And so we'll, this will go over here and that will go over there. But then... If you want to think of a field, forensic psychiatry is when the two mix. And, you know, the, someone is going to be making decisions about whether someone had 
intentionality and free will and, and civilized societies since the 17th century have said, you know, if you start raving mad and you commit a crime, that's going to be different than otherwise. Uh, you know, I think, uh, um, embarrassingly, some of these studies are like, I mean, these people go to eat at Chinese restaurants too much. They think you open the brain, it's going to be like a fortune cookie, and inside yeah, it's going right, to say, right. I wanted to kill a lot of people. Right, right, right. Mm. But they never find anything <laughs> yeah. like that. And yeah. just to get to the notion of explanation so you can get some sense, um, you know, Fred is a teetotaler. Why? His father was an alcoholic. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. He responded by being a teetotaler. Jim is an alcoholic. His father was an alcoholic. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> do, 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 do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It, 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 we can create these pseudo explanations, yeah. right, at any level, right? Mm -hmm. And it's very tempting. We live by them. And and and, and, and what I'm and, and what I'm saying is, as I think I. I'm, they demonstrate they're nonsense, right? <laughs> but we we like them, and we now have a new kind of nonsensical explanation like that, which is neuromania, mm -hmm. right? We, we we like to have this new addition to these pseudo explanations that, as you say, we live by. Hmm. You know, from at least from the literary sort of history of science and philosophy perspective that I would have, I I I. I don't think I said anything like consciousness is in the brain. I think I would just, you know, uh, would say that consciousness requires, for our species, requires a brain, but is embodied and is about, you know, interacting with the world. Um, and in other kinds of creatures, like, you know, the famous octopus, for example, um, it's a much more of a whole body phenomenon. And, um, and arguably is out there in the world, too, if you take the kind of panpsychist take on the on the hard problem, which I think is very attractive and interesting, so why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, but again, like, as far as I understand, it's not nothing professional at stake in saying that. I, I just find it, you know, something kind of cool about it. Sure. Um, so, uh, so yeah. So, I, I, at least uh, you know, at least for our, for us, it's like it requires the brain. That's all. I would say, well, but I'm course, sure these folks know, would disagree. Holes, I mean, brain is a particular organization of, of neurons and, and the nervous system, and slime molds have a nervous system too, that, you know, and plants have certain kinds of memory and they have it through physical processes in their cells that, you know, don't correspond to neurons, but it's their own system. So there's lots of ways of building memories out of, out of cells and ours gets organized into brains. Mm -hmm. Embodiment is uh, one of those very slippery, very cool, subjects right now. I mean, Andy Clark's written famously about this, but um, I think one way to think about it is um, Dennis Noble talks about top-down causality when it comes to the heartbeat. So you can take a cardiac cell and it will start beating in the right medium. And then you say, what's the cause of the heartbeat? Now, you can look at the ion channels in that myocardial cell and go, oh, look, those ion channels, it's through the flow of ions through those channels that leads to a change in the membrane of the heart cell. But then you have to go, well, if those ion channels were just floating around alone, there'd be no heartbeat. They have to be embedded in a heart cell. So then where do you point to the heartbeat? What's the cause of the heartbeat? The whole thing is the heartbeat. There is no thing that you can point at, which is more fundamental to the heartbeat, you need the whole thing, right? And that's what embodiment mm. is, is that you can't avoid being trans-level when you talk about the heartbeat. The membrane's not doing it alone, the ion channels are not doing it alone, the ions aren't doing it alone, it's the whole thing. So that's really what embodiment is, is that you, you need the whole thing in its organizational structure to do the thing that you're seeing in its totality. Right? And that's, I think, the reasonable way of thinking about embodiment. It's ended up having a sort of hokey, slightly holistic thing that's attached to it, but that, that's separate. Okay, thank you. Thank you.